So hopefully everybody had a good afternoon. How many got your naps in? I didn't. <laughs> I missed it. All right. Our hymn for tonight is number 494, Like a River Glorious. Number 494. I give you a moment to find it. <laughs> well, I would like to go home. Yeah. Like a river glorious is God's perfect peace over all victorious. In its bright increase, perfect yet it floweth, fuller every day. Perfect yet it groweth, deeper all the way. Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed. Finding as he promised perfect peace and rest. Hidden in the hollow of thy blessed hand. Never fool can follow, never traitor stand. Not a surge of worry. Not a shade of care, not a blast of hurry, touch the spirit there. Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed, finding as he promised perfect peace and rest. Every joy or trial falleth from above, traced upon our tile by the Son of Love. May we trust Him fully, all for us to do. They who trust Him wholly Find him wholly true. Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed. Finding as he promised, perfect peace and rest. Amen. Thank you, Kathy. Well, it is good to see everyone this evening. Uh, let me invite you to turn your Bible to Psalms chapter 1. Psalms, book of Psalms chapter 1. And uh, I'm sorry, Psalms chapter 1. And um, while you're kind of getting there, I thought it might be good on uh, Sunday evening just in case, um, because I know Sunday morning, it's, it's never always easy to try and like have dialogue afterwards. But I was wondering if based upon the message this morning, the text and the things that we walk through, if there were any questions or comments based on, because a lot of times you'd like to say, hey, what we just spoke about, does anyone have any questions or comments or any thoughts, additional thoughts that could be helpful to the body? It's just wondering if anyone had Comments or questions, thoughts? Okay, all right, wonderful. Um, so Psalm 1, let me, uh, why it's pivotal for me. It's, uh, one of the things that's good, I m mentioned about teaching hermeneutics this morning, which is the, the interpretation of Scripture. That's, that's for those uh, who've taken classes. Um, uh, so, one of the things that I like to do is ask questions of the text. So, for me, in this text this morning, one of the questions was, why is John crying? 
You know, that, that makes you then think, you know, especially coming out of chapter 4. So I like to impose questions into the text to help me try to unpack the text or understand it better. Um, and so for me, when it comes to the, the songs of, uh, of the Hebrews of old, um, which they still will implement in services today, why would this be the very first one? Very unlikely it was the first one penned, but when these songs are put together in their songbook, if you would, why would you put it number one? And I think that's important because generally if you have a book of songs, you, you have certain favorites based on, and you know them by number, and general rule of thumb is you, you want the first one to be something that comes out of the gate swinging, right? You, you want it to be something for which is you know, familiar to, to, to people or something that's going to grab people's attention. So I started asking myself, why is this the first song that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? So let me just make this very clear. Human authors, like when we read the Gospels, getting information from people, like Mark's gospel primary source of information was, was Peter, but all Scripture is written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So it is, it is inspired divinely by God Himself. So He wanted these words, even, I believe, the order of how it's put together. And so the construct of both the Old and New Testament in its order and even in the arrangements of these songs. Um, so the question that bodes why became important to me. I think it's a very powerful song, and we'll, it's a short one, and so we'll walk through it tonight. For me, it became very impactful, though. And, and let, me, let me say this. I mentioned English authors this morning. Uh, like this morning's message is one I've shared multiple times. I love deeply. I love dearly. God has used that passage to minister to my heart. I hope he has to, to others when I've had the chance to share that. It and this, what I'm sharing tonight, are probably the two primary passages I use when I'm talking about what does strength, strength to stand counseling do? What is the organization that I'm about? What do we intend to do? And I, I have the privilege to serve as the executive director there to give it sort of the formation of what we how we approach counseling and how we un understand biblical truth within our lives. So these are, 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 are messages that God put on my heart and wove together in my life, but it helps to shape where our, our ministry goes. So we have a partnering church on Wednesdays. I'm at Meadowbrook Church in Gadsden, Alabama all day. They pay strength to stand counseling, and I'm there, and then they provide counseling for their members. So when I preached at their church, just by way of inter Pastor One introduced I preached what I preached this morning there because it's, it's, it's fundamental. I'll be teaching a class I mentioned this morning. That's where I'll be teaching this class on biblical problem solving, which has its root in Psalm 1. So it, it kind of, this is where it starts. For me, when I was at seminary, at Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, I had a professor, Dr. Bruce Ware. He was a theology professor. And I think Dr. Ware is... is uh, um, I think he's an amazing professor, a very gracious and godly man. But his impact in my life came not so much by the theology study, but by what he challenged us to do um, by way of personal meditation and reflection. Now, I must tell you, I misunderstood the assignment, but I was grateful I did because what, what I understood the assignment was for half the semester we would take one passage of Scripture and, and three to four times a week, just read over it. Um, I chose Psalm 1, and I, I got into it. I'm, I'm not a Greek scholar. I'm not a Hebrew scholar. But I am grateful for modern-day tools to where I don't feel like I have to be a, a Greek or Hebrew scholar to unpack understanding of original language and its implications and, again, in, in the um, its impact and, and clarity. So, um, so anyhow... This formation of how I had fallen in love with counseling, pastoring the first church I pastored, um, this became sort of the fundamental, I guess, grid by way in which I would approach counseling. 
and uh, it became very helpful, and so I hoped it would become helpful in other people's lives. Um, so we, we jump in, just kind of that by way of background. Let's look at what it says. I'll read the whole of the psalm. I will not try to get through all my notes on this this evening. I don't want to do that. I want to teach for about 20, 25 minutes, and then if there's any questions or comments, just feel free. Uh, and if the Lord allows us to come back together at some point in time, then we'll, we'll pick back up and continue with it. And if not, hopefully we'll end at a good spot that will be encouraging. So, so <clears throat> starting in, in Psalm uh, verse 1, chapter 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. About the same time I was working through this, we had a guest speaker at Southern Seminary. This was in early, uh, well, it was in uh, 1999, and 98 or 99, um, and his name was John Piper. He was the was the retired, but then pastor at Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He's written a number of books, but probably most notable for the book Desiring God, for which he makes this as his thesis for the book, and he said it in a message, and it grabbed my attention. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. And so as I was walking through this, this passage, part of my prayer became, God, glorify Yourself where I see You clearly and I savor You deeply. And this psalm helped me in that mindset, in that mode. The word blessed is the Hebrew word ashir. It is a beautiful word. It quite literally means uh, happy. That's how it's translated in the New Testament. But it's often uh, the most under impactful way to understand it is a joyful state of contentment, a condition of comfort and security for which a person is to be admired. So blessed, a joyful state of contentment, a condition of comfort and security for which a person is being mine. Isn't, isn't that what we desire? I mean, that, I think, I think if you peel back for everything people have enjoyed in, in the fullness of the bounty of what this country has offered so many, we still find so many people who aren't really happy or satisfied. Right? There's sort of this desperate longing. And, and to be honest with you, we see that within the context of, of the church as, as well as outside the church. I don't want to, uh, you know, so, so yet, and yet, this first song of great importance, the first, very first words to sing out. And by the way, song is such a beautiful thing because it's repetition. And it often gets into our mind quite easily, doesn't it? We all have favorite hymns or tunes or songs that we hum along in our mind that we are able to whistle to or, or sing that uh, even if, if you're like me and you hope no one else is hearing you sing, you still like to sing. You know? I, in fact, I was out in the parking lot. Um, I have a, 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 a several favorite bands, but one of my favorite bands on the radio, my favorite song from this band was playing. And so I was sitting out in my truck with my windows completely up, singing very loudly, much louder than I was singing the song here because I know, I know what I sound like. I've heard myself sing on tape and it's not pretty, so I don't want to put anybody there. that. But you, we have songs, right? They become repetitious and they're easy to bring to state of mind. So, so blessed... This grand state of happiness 
is the man. And by the way, that, that is, a, that is a, a neutral term using there. It's just for humanity. Man is humanity. I realize now we're having to split distinctions. I don't. <laughs> You're a man or a woman biologically. That's, uh, that's part of the way it, why in our counseling um, we don't take insurance. We, we tell people, you can file, happy to give you a bill, but I'm not going to work with insurance companies because I'm convinced the more that the state and federal governments are involved in health care, which I'm grateful for COVID, they're covering a lot more in mental health and I'm grateful for it, but I believe they're going to want to dictate what can be said and not be said, and I am not going to... I, 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 I know the greatest contentment of one's heart is to understand who they are in Christ and to understand that they are made in His image and bear His image. So, so I, my heart breaks for someone who's walking through or struggling with gender identity issues, as it's often called, or same-sex attractions, as that's been very prominent but being pushed more, more out there in the last probably 10 years. But I'm going to counsel off of biblical truth, and that may not align with the person's feelings or emotions. And going back to what I said from the book of Ruth this morning, um, I get there are times when your emotions want you to be moved in this direction. But Jeremiah has clearly made it known to us that there is nothing more wicked than the human heart. So we can be deceived by our emotions, and, and, uh, and it can lead to a great deal of heartache, not just for the person who does that, but for others who are connected to that. So, um, uh, so that being said, blessed is the man or woman who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. So I want to unpack these, these words, and then I want you to notice the progress. So this person does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. That literally ungodly would translate better without God. So he does not walk in the council getting the instruction or encouragement from those without God, nor stand in the path of sinners, those who embrace a sinning lifestyle, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. The word scornful is that they defend their lifestyle and attack righteousness. So I want you to notice the progression. Here is someone who has rejected God. I'll, I'll, I'll go, I'll just keep moving left. So here's someone who's rejected God. Okay, they're without God. That's, don't, you don't walk with them to get their counsel. Doesn't mean that we don't befriend them to, to put grace in front of them. But you don't walk with them to get their counsel. In other words, I'm not... I don't want to live my life off of their truth or their, or their perception of life. So, so that's to walk. Stand um, with, in the path of sinners. Now, the word sinner is someone who has embraced a certain lifestyle that is contrary to biblical truth. Or sit in the seat of the scornful. That is someone who's not just embraced a lifestyle that, that, that rejects biblical truth but they now attack that which is good and right and righteous and godly. So you, if you look at our culture, can you see where there's been a bit of a progression in that? I'm 54 years old, right? I, so we can identify with recognizing what, what has shaped the way of our thinking and how people perceive things in that movie. Now, the interesting thing coming back here, notice the progression of intimacy. So if we're taking a walk, any of us, and we're walking, I haven't been around the building that much, but say we were walking out to the parking lot, and, and we're, 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 our conversation is going to be surface level. But if something in the midst of that conversation causes us to want to stop and go deeper, when we stop, we've taken another level by way of intimacy, right? Because now we're not... You know, we're not, the end goal is not to get to the car and we're having just, just surface conversation. Something hit a nerve to where we're going to stop and take a little bit of time to walk through this. Now, if in the midst of that conversation, it goes deeper and we sit down, that's a much more intimate. Does that make sense? So the progression of intimacy is blessed is the man or woman this joyful state of contentment who rejects, 
who, as Paul would say, if you look in the book of Ephesians, the book of Colossians, and I think Galatians, um, I think it's through three, you will see Paul say to the church, put off the old man and these desires. Put on the new man, right? So you, you don't put on until you put off. You, you, you can't. You have to put off to put on. So it's, it's like you must reject. So here the psalmist is laying out the first thing you have to do is put off. You have to reject. You have to reject the counsel of the, of the unbiblical, ungodly. You, 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 must, you must resist or, or push away from those views that attack righteousness and defend unrighteousness. We must. So we, we can't embrace that. So that's, the, that's sort of the first thing is this idea of putting off and this idea of seeing progression. And, and that's, where, that's where, so for my, for my 13-year-old, all she's sort of known is a culture by which, say, g- gender dysphoria has been embraced. And, and yet there's no science for it. So um, there's no science for a lot of what is talked about. I, I, I'll take just a moment as an illustration here. I don't want to get too deep down the rabbit hole. But when it comes to same-sex attraction, that's been something that's, that's come forth in our generation, has it not? Rock Hudson, great movie star. Most people had no idea until all of a sudden his passing, we realized this was a man who had a lifestyle which was hidden. And so, so we go through, as AIDS came out in the 80s, but I still remember the very first time I heard the word AIDS. I was literally riding in my brother's truck. We were heading to school. He's, a, he's 14 months older than me. We were, we were going to school, and, the very, and this was a radio station in Atlanta that we're listening to, and this, this first thought of AIDS. Well, all of a sudden, out of AIDS, which I do not believe was like, God's judgment against homosexuals by any means. Don't hear me say that at all. But all sin is judged in some way. All unrighteousness is judged in some way. And sometimes you have the impact of choices that we make that, that affect us, that impact us, that, that are damaging to us. So, And it's not like oh, God's going to wipe out the homosexual community, but no, don't see that. But we, we, choices we make, whether that's, by the way, anything outside of God's covenant relationship between a man and a woman in marriage is wrong. So I make no distinction about that. But it's become to where it was very much hidden to then coming out. To in the last 10, I don't, I don't even know it's been 10 years, that it's like, if you disagree... You are mean-spirited and bigoted. And it's like, no, I'm not. And I don't appreciate being told that because I disagree with you. As a matter of fact, someone who basically says there are no values for which we are all are held to is holding to a value that we all have to hold to or else they're upset with us. So it makes no sense, but, but they say that. There's a, a really interesting book. Um, called The Madness of the Crowds by uh, uh, Douglas Murray. Douglas Murray, is he's not a Christian. He's a British guy. He's very, very witty. Very, very witty. Um, um, his book, The Madness of the Crowds, it is about the, the agenda that is being pressed on Western culture. And uh, he, is a, he is in an active relationship with another man. So he is a homosexual. Um, but his insight into that arena is so good. And, and the madness of the crowds is, I, you know, wouldn't agree, oh, I don't agree wholly with the book, but there's great insights. But one of the things he talks about is that in our culture, and by the way, I know this, I was with a friend of mine in, oh, just, just thinking I'm not in Moody, I'm in kind of the Trustville Moody area, in Trustville, a little more far that way. He's a friend of mine from New York City. He's visiting family, and, and it's Thanksgiving, and I'm over eating Thanksgiving dinner with his family. He had gracious enough to invite me over. Now, if I'm the, if I'm the invited guest and I'm not family, I'm not going to say much, 
But in this conversation, mostly with PhDs or master's degree people, they said and all agreed that homosexuality, you're born that way. And I'm going, it's not true. But I'm not going to say anything because I haven't eaten turkey yet. So, so I will hold my tongue. Hold my bubbles as my, we used to tell our kids. But here's the thing. Probably the two most far-leaning liberal psychiatric institutes in the world are the Royal Association of Psychiatry from the UK and the American Association of Psychiatrists based here in the United States. And neither one of them would confirm that you're born that way. Because to say you're born that way must conclude that somewhere on a gene or in a chromosome, there is something that is different. And in that difference, that's how you are, you're born then. And here, it's, it's, so it would be like anything else unique or different. <clears throat> so, so take Down syndrome, for example. We can test and know the likelihood of this child having Down syndrome based upon what's going on that we see on this chromosome with this particular gene. Now, we've not been able to find that. I, I'm going to say it probably doesn't exist, but Murray makes this observation. He doesn't believe we will either, uh, but he says, what if we did? Then what would happen if people not wanting to raise a homosexual child could and would it be all right to have an abortion to eliminate? That's a power. And, and by the way, if you don't think we're there, the country I love, Iceland, CBS News, you might have seen this five years ago, reported Iceland had eradicated autism. Made enough headway to where CBS News sends a news crew to Reykjavik, Iceland, to interview these doctors because in somehow they think, because by the way, the longest lifespan of men and women in the world is in Iceland. So how's this country in the north? What, you know, so it's like maybe it's because we're eating all this fish oil, we call it lisi or what, you know, maybe something. But they've eradicated Down syndrome. And they were, and, the, and CBS was captivated by it and thought the audience would. So it's on, it's on the news. Well, you know how, they, how they've eradicated it? Here's what they came to the conclusion. We can spot it. In the chromosome, this gene, so we're just doing abortions before in womb. So we're just terminating life, if it's a possibility. We're not even certain. God could heal, but if there's a possibility. That's how we've eradicated. That's not eradicating autism. That's in womb killing. Because I don't like the possibility of what might come forth. You see, so when someone says that we're born that way, there's no evidence. And yet, that's the general... The only evidence I've found is a singer by the name of Lady Gaga who came out with an album that says, I'm born this way. And it's like the whole world all of a sudden embraced. Yes, you can live any way you want because that's the way you're born. And I'm going, no. No, you can't. So, so when you realize that our system of understanding, even science, is now under attack. Where people make the statement, it becomes scientific that you're born that way when there's no science behind it. Good is under attack. And you see we get further and further down the rabbit hole. And, and that becomes problematic from a cultural view. And it becomes problematic when we personally embrace it. We, we can't. I'm not... Listen... There are many things that move me, feelings, emotions. I weep a lot more at 54 than I did at 24. I'm much more tenderhearted. I, I'm grateful for that. But I can't allow emotions to dictate and align the direction that I walk. I need, it's a narrow path that is true and truth. And that's what we need to stay in. So this person must choose to reject this. But, by the way, it's not just reject, because just to reject will lead to legalism. The Pharisees were great about rejecting. So that's why we have a motto, truth and love, when it comes to counseling. Think of a tree. The outside is the bark, very hard, protects the tree. Inside is much softer. It's where the nutrients run up. Truth without love leads 
to legalism. Do this. There's no compassion, empathy, or love, or joy connected to it. Do this. It's rigid. It's cold. It's pharisaical. It builds fences around fences around fences. Do we lose the joy of our salvation? Love without truth leads to emotional embracing of anything. If we're to love but have no standard of truth, we will say anything and everything is okay if you feel good about it. So it's got to be both ends. So, so we must guard. We put off what he says by way of where our counsel is coming from. But this person's delight is in the law of Yahweh. See, by the way, when you read through the Old Testament, you'll see God, and, and there's multiple names for God, but, but the, the big three are Yahweh, El Shaddai, and Elohim. Yahweh, more often than not, will be when you see Lord in all caps. So most of the time you'll see it either Lord, capital L, small O-R-D. Most of the time that's at an I. Again, there's no strict to this, but it may help when you... When you see Adonai, very compassionate. God often is speaking to His people as a loving Father who is wooing and, 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 and uh, compassionate, um, uh, mercy extended. God, which is often you'll see Lord God together, God is Elohim more often than not, and that tends to refer back to God of creation. Lord, all caps, is Yahweh. And it tends to refer to God of covenant. So when you see Lord God together, it's often God of covenant from the God of our creation. The God who created us is in covenant with us. And so they're making this application that, God, you gave us life. You brought us forth, but you also entered into a covenant with us. And although we are unfaithful, you are never unfaithful to us. So it is a God who, who gives covenant. So this, this word is Yahweh. So, but his delight is in the law of Yahweh, and in his law he meditates day and night. Now, the word meditation, you've probably heard this before. I did even as a, as a, a young believer at the age of 15, is that it, meditation is, is sort of like this idea of, of renewal. You, 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 you churn it over and over. The old analogy that that I heard was like how a chow, a cow, chow, how a cow chews its cud. That's when you're trying to say two words at one, you put them all. You know, it, because it, it, it eats and chews and then goes into its stomach and comes back up and it chews it again just to get all the nutrients out, right? And so that was often used, but that's not actually, it's a good analogy, but that's not the word image that this, this conveys. The, the word image that's used in meditate here is like a big cat that's cornered its prey and it knows it's about to eat and it's purring because it's happy. It's, it's, it's about to get to feast and it's purring because of its delight. Now that's the question that posed back to us. When it comes to God's Word, do we have an appetite that causes us to delight to spend time in God's truth. That it becomes the nurture of our heart. That it is substance for our soul. Uh, that's, that's the picture that the psalmist had. Man, oh Lord, your word I delight in. I meditate upon it. I am pursuing it like it's substance more important than even bread for my body. It's the nourishing for my soul. That's the way the psalmists unpack this. And it became incredibly important. I am, uh, I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, I'm sorry, I've gone much longer. In, uh, so explain. so let, me, let, me, um, hmm, let me shift gears here. Let me go on and, and finish doing the textual understanding and then make a couple of quick applications. The ungodly are not so. They are like chaff. Uh, oh, gosh, gosh, I'm skipping over. I'm sorry. So on his law, verse, verse 2, on his law, he's meditating day and night. 
Okay, so he's consuming biblical truth. This person, he, she, will be like a tree planted by rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Now, think of it this way. So, so um, think, of, think of an oasis, right? Um, we've all at least seen imagery of an oasis if you've never been to one. Has anyone here actually been to like in a, through a desert region and came up upon an oasis? I, I haven't either. Um, but we've seen enough to know, understand what that, what that would look like, right? So picture an individual who's on a journey and they're crossing the desert and they've run out of water, right? And you see this oasis. This oasis in the midst of death is a place of life, right? In the middle of that desert, there is the place of hope. There's water, there are trees, there are fruits. It's, you know, this is where one can drink and eat. This is sustaining nourishment for the physical body. Without it, I would die, I would perish. If I've run out of food and water in the desert and I don't come upon an oasis, I am going to perish, right? The question every church needs to ask itself is in our community, are we an oasis of hope? Now, I'm going to come back to the fruit in just a minute. But let me tell you, I think what might be worse than no gospel witness at all is if you get to the oasis and find it's only a mirage. That would be really disheartening. When it comes to the fruit, let's make application. Chris and I were talking after the service. Um, let's make application to what Paul says with the fruit of the Spirit. So here's this fruit in its season. This is this oasis. This is this, is this church. And it bears forth its fruit in its season. What does that fruit look like? Paul says the fruit of the Spirit. This is what God graciously brings supernaturally through us is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, mercy, gentleness, and self-control. That, that's what the world desperately wants to pick and eat and feast upon. And so God help us personally, corporately, to be an oasis of hope in the midst of a desert that has in this country uh, has, has really, really moved so far away. And, and, and we're in two places of the country where um, a term was coined called a God haunting, and it's not a negative term. It means where you still have the influence of gospel Christian life from previous generations. You find that in the South and in, in, in the Midwest, you find cultural values that reflect the gospel there. But you move outside of that in our country, and it's, very, it's distinctly different. That's moved away. Having lived in Western Europe, it's even further away. And, and we are impacted philosophically by way of worldview from what comes out of Western Europe. Specifically, if you want to know what we will, if you want to know what, what the Northeast and the West Coast will look like, in five years, look at what Stockholm, Sweden is doing right now. You will see. They, they, they are the dog wagging every, the tail, the rest of the world. Uh, the west of Western culture, not, not Far East, but by way of Western understanding and worldview and philosophy. They are directing. And it comes, comes Western, and it, and it propagates in this country, starting Northeast, West Coast, and it makes its way in and around. And, and, and it, it trickles in the Midwest and it's in, in the Southeast. So 10 years from now, what you see in Stockholm will be very prevalent here. And so um, that's why we have to bring biblical truth in a very loving, gracious way back into the culture and back into individual relationships and the way we speak and the way we engage people. It, it's absolutely necessary. That's a whole other lesson, maybe down the road at some time. Um, but but an important one nonetheless because we have to based upon where things are, are, are going, what God has called us to do. So anyway, let me wrap up the, the textual 
looking. The ungodly are not so. They are like chaff. So if, you, if you've ever raised any wheat or millet or something, a, a grain seed that has that, that paper-like thin sheathing, you don't want to mix that up, right? It, it leaves a bitterness. If you've ever taken... We used to raise wheat um, and millet around our place, um, big farmers in Loganville, and uh, love to go dove hunting after those fields are, are um, you know, cut. Um, but uh, if you ever took some fresh wheat and took it to the mill and had it ground up, you want to make sure you got that chaff off of it or else it would make your, your bread very bitter. Um, so that chaff, it protects the kernel as it grows, but then when the kernel is, is ready to be harvested, even in days of old, it's why, they, you know, uh, Gideon was found threshing the wheat. You, you, you beat it and you throw it up and it's so light the wind just blows it away. Which, by the way, whole nother lesson. But when Gideon is called by God, he's like down in the low part where the wind can't blow and he's throwing it up because the Midians have been invading and God says, you great man of valor. He was, he was a scaredy cat. God often sees what we don't see even amongst ourselves. But that's, that's a whole nother lesson. Anyway, so... The ungodly are not so, they are like chaff. They have no substance which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. They will break, for Yahweh knows the way of the righteous. This should be an encouragement to every one of us. He knows us. We're not perfect, but if we walk in righteousness, if we trust and follow and pursue Him... It is not our perfection, but it's His perfection. Re- remember, religion, Tim Keller says it this way, religion is us trying to get good enough for God. Christianity is God recognizing we can't be good enough, and so He comes to us. And that's the beauty of the gospel. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Um, I think I better pause right there with our time. Thoughts or questions on that? I had some, but you already answered it. <laughs> <laughs> well, praise the Lord. <laughs> you know, it, it said that that tree brought forth its fruit in its season. And I've planted a lot of fruit trees, and some of them will bear fruit two or three years mm. down the road after they're planted. Yes. But you plant a pecan tree, and the one's like a, a short pecan, it'll take seven or eight years before it bears mm-hmm. fruit. Mm-hmm. So That's right. Not everybody that accepts the Lord starts, you know, being used of Him right off the bat. I think that's a great word. I think there is, for all of us, a point of growth and pruning and maturity, is there not? Um, I, Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in Him, being rooted and built up in the faith. It's almost this picture of a, of a sapling tree that goes in, and it must grow, and it must be pruned. And, and yeah, we should absolutely recognize that, that maturity and growth is, is necessary. And for some, that might take a couple of years. For others, that may take seven or eight. There should be growth and development, but you're right. Sometimes it may take longer. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. That's a great word. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, good word. Good word. Any other thoughts? Well, it's been a delight to be with you again this this Sunday. Grateful for the chance to to share God's word any time um, that we can be together. So let me pray for us as we go forth into this week that God may grant to us eyes to see Him, hearts to savor Him, um, the help to trust Him, and the hope that knows despite whatever circumstances or situations we find ourselves in that he does know the way of the righteous and he upholds with his mighty good right hand. Father, thank you. Thank you for the privilege of hope-filled living that comes in Christ and for the beauty for which you grant 
life, how you bring um, beauty out of ashes, how you give life out of death, hope in the midst of heartache. Lord, how you have called us to walk righteously before you with humility and grace. Lord, may the hope of the gospel be ever present on our lips and displayed in our lives. Lord, may it, may it be true that you will be glorified in us um, as we are most satisfied in you. For we pray this, Lord Jesus, in your name and for your glory, but for our good. Amen. Amen.